पविता मैडम हेलो सर यस शाल वी स्टार्ट सर यस गुड आफ्टरनून सर विथ युअर परमिशन शाल वी स्टार्ट द सेशन यस सर प्लीज थैंक यू सर थैंक यू हाँ पविता मैडम बोर्ड टू यू प्लीज सर हेलो यस मैम Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the evening session of uh, this FDP. I hope you are enjoying. The participants are enjoying the contents, and it's really an informative sessions. So our next session is on accelerating AI with GPU. So which is one of the prime topic in the era of AI. So uh, on this occasion, I would like to take this opportunity and uh, privilege to introduce our next expert uh, speaker, Mr. Hariran Venugopal, a really uh, young um, researcher. is working as a partner solution architect in fintech electronic system uh, in, in for nvidia ai hpc and uh, he is responsible for a lot of uh, projects and lot of uh, smaller and bigger projects with uh, very key areas like end to end ml pipeline modeling for to productions accelerating cores profiling ml model so these are really really core areas and it's really uh, uh, what uh, we can Take advantages of his words and his experience. He also worked in the proof of concept for software and hardware. It's really a core area. He is certified GPU architect and professional trainer. He has nationally conducted many workshops on deep learning and uh, machine learning. He is currently working in speech analysis and neuroscience, which is one of uh, his uh, domain and uh, current project. So, sir, thank you for sparing uh, your valuable time for us. and uh, for this fdp and uh, we uh, uh, on the behalf of whole department and college i uh, thank you you to uh, getting us this opportunity to letting you and uh, making this world more informative with more such sessions thank you sir over to you sir uh thank you vinay sir uh good evening everyone so thanks for the introduction thanks for having me in uh, let me quickly share my screen Uh, is my screen is visible yes sir so uh, good evening everyone thanks thanks for joining and it, it was a great introduction from vinay sir uh, thank you so much for doing things and uh, all the best for all the ftps you have conducting still now i hope you have four more days left and uh, best of luck for that and today's agenda what we are looking at is on the core areas of ai and how ais can be accelerated by using a gpus so i want to do divide this into two sections so one where we will first half we will be covering on gpus and artificial intelligence where we will talk little bit introduction about my company as well as nvidia and uh, evolution of gpus and how effectively we can use uh, gpus industrial use cases in gc kind of a thing on the second part of the session i wanted to cover most on the jets and devices and also a collaboration of higher education and research in which nvidia can uh, collaborate with the institutions like you well the, all the professors like you from the institution level department level or individual professor level and we can do that and we'll talk a little bit on setting up a center of excellence in the colleges what are the offering from nvidia we offer and then we'll open up for a q and a so before getting into the thing i just want to address one more thing i work as a partner solution architect for nvidia directly so i handle for all west region and most customers are enterprise customers and hcr customers where i uh, explain them or maybe we handhold them to get them adopted to ai technologies by using gpu kind of a thing but uh, in this introduction i just wanted to un 
take you through what this nvidia actually does as a company because the most of the things we handle in the knowing about nvidia is nvidia is known as a gaming company right so there are a lot of things a lot of times we will know about nvidia as a gaming company it is having a graphic cards and all those things mainly used for gaming and all those things which i wanted to redefine it and make them understand that ai computing is what we are doing right now so what we do in the sector of what nvidia does in the sector of ai or nvidia is we started our journey in 1996 with a keen interest in working only through pc graphics where we were having a certain pro problem statement which we wanted to solve in the area of graphics mainly in the animation industry and yes of course gaming industry where your gaming performance was lying on the cpu where we thought as what if we can have one more co processor which can define ourselves from the uh, continuously from take us away from this cpu processing and put us into the gpu and how we wanted to go and that is how we started our journey in 1996 but in 2006 when the hpc was arising and it was coming into the picture where we converted ourselves into a gpu computing company because we understood that okay graphic cards are no longer a graphic cards it is not only used for gaming purpose it can be used for mathematical operation also and that is how we started to understand that okay we will now move into something called a gpu computing and handle all those things we will touch a base upon how this transition was happening from the industry point of view how the graphics was converted from the gpu point of view later in the slide and in another 10 years we were able to come to something called a ai computing where ai was started to boom its field and where the gpus were again a heart of the ai and because we see a lot of networks are coming into picture right so that is how we came into picture of ai computing and we started our journey from not only from the hardware but also from the software side because hardware alone doesn't make a complete ai right so because when i say that i am having a gpus what i have to provide also is i have to provide a tool set for making it use it in a very right manner otherwise what is the point of having a world class hardware when your program is not able to communicate to it properly and that is how we have developed our core power not only in the uh cpus uh, not only in the hardware side but also in the software side so if you look at the graph of the rise of gpu computing on the overall if you could see that from 1990 all the things were a single threaded performance kind of a thing right so you have a uh, you have very specific kind of an application which was tend to move towards multi threading kind of a thing otherwise everything was a single threaded performance kind of a thing from your hpc on that background kind of a thing and it was growing in 1.5 per percent per year but we can see a stagnant that is happening from 2010 right so because no longer application is a single threaded people are moving away from a single threaded to something called a multi threading application where you need an architecture which can communicate which can use your gpu as well as your cpu effectively to go forward and if you see the rise which we are expecting by 2025 is going to be 1000x right because that is how the 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 power of gpus and the the demand for uh, gpus is going to go up and because the all the application in today's world we write it in a multi node kind of an application it is not only in the uh, uh, ai field i'm talking about hpc and ai of course itself is going to be a game changer right at least for next uh, 15 years it's going to be completely surrounded by ai kind of a thing and of course then quantum comes into picture and what not everything comes into picture so we wanted to define ourselves in this journey by not only providing you the hardware which was wanted to do it but also the software that integrates this overall journey and take it forward so if you look at it from the industry point of view we have lot of top ai software companies right you can have google microsoft amazon facebook whatever company you take tesla these all are the top ai software companies but whether they are hosting their Uh, performance whether they are hosting it on the cloud or on prem the infrastructure is going to be same right either i can put it in a cloud but again cloud again i need some uh, cpu or a gpu to handle it or i can i can have, have a local server or a workstation where again i need a cpu or gpu to handle it right so the from the industry point of view the 
the leaders who if you can see from the gpu marketing is intel amd and ibm so these are the leaders who are into the cpu so most of your cpus are from intel the processor are from intel or now the the game is moving towards amd or ibm comes into picture which its own skill set and taking into it but when you see gpu industry it is fully lying with nvidia right so there are gpus yes of course amd produces its own gpu intel gives its own gpu but the industry leader we see it is only nvidia right because this point we have attained not only by giving you the hardware we have done extensive work in producing a world class hardware but also we have done extensive work in the layers on top of the hardware so that it can be used effectively or we have done so much of work in this gpu computing field so that the other people who are uh, take at least 20 years to reach to what we have achieved today so this is what we i want to address we are not only about the gpu computing we are not only in the gaming company we are the ai computing uh, company where we have transformed ourselves from the gaming addressing the gaming addressing the gpu and now into ai market and i also represent uh, wintec electronic system this is the uh, company which i currently work with and we are the wintec electronic system is the most trusted it infrastructure and ai uh, infrastructure company and we are the preferred partners of nvidia in their gpu computing for the west region in ai and hpc domain and our main task is to help the customer to set up a complete ai ml lab with the optimized end to end solution for the problem statement with the customers are working on where we concentrate on four keen areas in setting up a ai ml lab where we provide the missions when we also have an expertise to work with the customers in optimizing their code building their code and putting it to the model kind of a training and also we work with the edge processing and inferencing production line where we take the code from the lab and put it to the production and also we help the customers in developing their ci cd pipeline ml ops on maintaining their cluster on the own because now it is not only one gpu or two gpu people are working right it's like a multiple gpus multiple kinds of containers or workloads which people are working so we are also working in this ci cd pipeline kind of a thing and also we have partnered with many ai startups across the india to jointly address the problem statement of in the uh, in the ai domain where we work towards it so coming back of the need of artificial intelligence or even uh, to the address it more clearly what is the need of gpu computing to look into it we need to little bit understand about this artificial intelligence how it is actually in the verge of taking everything into the artificial intelligence right so it is no longer restricted to one field there is no field today without an artificial intelligence right anywhere you go you go to the civil department you will be having some requirement which can be solved by using artificial intelligence you go to the metallurgy department where they use artificial intelligence you go to the physics department and there people who are working in hpc use an artificial intelligence kind of a thing is where this whole transition is actually happening right from your autonomous car i'm not even talking about autonomous car your ada system or in your infotainment which you are using in your car is now artificially intelligence capable of things right so and the uh, this is not only because of artificial intelligence was able to do it it is because of the performance or achievements this artificial intelligence were able to show from the your playgo thing or your facial recognition or your speech synthesis or presently the drug discovery kind of a thing the achievements ai have made is humongous right and currently we are in a period where we are very uncertain we do not know when the third wave is going to come we do not know whether the uh, what is going to be when is going to be the next lockdown and all those things this ai have played a very important role in the healthcare right because it had taken so much of data it has done hpc in a faster mode it has made data a scientist and the healthcare specialist and scientist or medical professional to arrive at some vaccination and it is really a miracle right arriving at some vaccination in the one and a half years of this covid journey we were able to produce the vaccination in within a one year and the testing was started so this all breakthroughs are happening in ai and it is fastering right we, we are no longer telling that okay ai may come into the field it is going into the field in a larger version right and also 
when we talk about ai it is not only we are talking about what happened 8 years back right we are talking from something from 1956 so uh, i have seen many people when they talk about ai they think that okay ai was something which came 8 years before 7 years before when alexnet came into picture or let's say 5 years before 4 years before it's not like that right the ai was there from 1956 in fact the word artificial intelligence was coined by john mccarthy one of the scientist who you also have a neural network algorithm in his name in 1956 and it started but we were having many winters right so from if you see the growth of ai which was started from 1956 then you had in 1969 then 1997 was the first supercomputer we were able to design which was able to beat the chess champion in the ship and then from 1997 again there was a winter even though 2002 it was happening till the 2012 alexnet came into picture now why this winter was happening so from 199 1956 there were two different uh, things which were stopping this the journey of ai or pitching of ai right so we had uh, we were not having data that was one of the reason why we were not able to flourish or more winter was keep on happening and second thing is the compute power uh, you can imagine right the we were, we are coming from the ages where we were using floppy disk for the storage devices and today we are using nano chips for doing tbs and tbs of uh, storages so we have crossed a log of time where today we are seeing or we can we can call ourselves at uh, this generation as a very lucky to experience this kind of transition that is happening over the years in the field of ai and are we achieved the total ai or are we in the close of achieving what an artificial intelligence can really do it is again a question mark right because we have achieved something called a purely reactive what is a purely reactive system is okay you play a chess in front of a ai system and the ai system will understand your moves and it going to uh, play an opponent opposite move against you right so this is what we called as a purely reactive kind of a thing and then came to something called a limited memory now limited memory is the stage where we are currently present because we uh, what we call as a limited memory systems are the memory systems where it is having a trained data it has some knowledge of the data it has been uh, trained which is a limited and then it takes decision based on that your recommendation system or your uh, google's map or whatever computer vision technique or nlp all comes under this kind of called limited memory which we are currently focusing on but we also have something called a theory of mind so what do you mean by theory of mind in types of ai is it is the ai which can able to understand the human emotions so today we are having this siri we are having this google assistant we are having alexa which is able to understand human command so i will say hey alexa play a song for me hey siri uh, uh, call to this guy a hey, google assistant book a uh, ticket for me now this this is able to understand the human commands but it is not able to understand the human emotions right so it will not react to according to our emotions it just react to according to our voice command and theory of of mind is something which addresses the human emotions where we move towards that where it will understand how the emotions works in our world and then it starts communicating with those things and uh, we are yet like 4 or 5 years away from achieving this uh, benchmark of the call something called a theory of mind and then you have something called a self aware kind of a robot where uh, you sh- you see this in movies right a robot come it kills everyone and do all those things uh, like a terminator or a robot movie and we are very far away at least we are one 30 40 years far away to invent something in this so uh, before that we all die due to age or something else but before this comes we are very very far away of 40 years so even though we have achieved a stages in ai today ai have done a uh, remarkable things to achieve the theory of mind or to uh, go towards self aware kind of an ai it is going to take a longer period so that amount of work is need to be done and here when we say that amount of work needs to be done as i said before it is not only about the algorithms we write it is about two important things one is data and another one is mainly your computing power so when we talk about data now 
we generate data in peta not even petaflops we are generating data in million of flops per second right so that is amount of the data it's getting generated every second in the world everyone in the world or like say 70% of the world started to use smartphones we are using 4g technologies we are ordering food we are using cab and all internet technologies we are doing we are very near to have a 5g technologies already phones are upgraded into 5g kind of a technology so the data which is getting produced is humongous and every day that much amount of tb petabyte zettabyte of data is getting accumulated in the google data center or any data center because we use data for everything and today in the covid situation the data has been increased right the whole uh, virtual things are happening your conferences your um, education institute teaching to the students so there are so much of amount of data now comes into picture but now the question is how far we can use the algorithm and data and how fast we are able to do the process right that is where your processor comes into picture that is where your gpu uh, comes into picture so if you see the previous generation when the cpu was performing and this is how we perform right we have a pipeline processor where i have three commands to do it then i'll have multiple pipeline where it will take from the fetch decode execute or again a second pipeline will be there when your second operation will go and then third operation will go there are a lot of this kind of an operations were happening right and then we moved into something called a, a multi execution units where multiple fetches were happening at the same time and then you were able to have different pipelines for decode execute and write back kind of a thing and looking back at how far we have come from is the first microprocessor which was introduced in 1970s was having only about 2250 transistors right so that was the that was the journey of we going towards something into the uh, processor kind of a thing when the cpus started to boom and all those things and then yes of course intel's famous 8086 which was having 29000 transistors so we were able to scale about 27000 transistors from just 9 years we were able to achieve this kind of a thing but when pentium was released it was around 95 lakhs of transistors were able to reach that is in 20 years from 1979 to 1999 we were able to achieve this kind of performances in cpus but the problem is we can't keep on stacking this transistor into my cpus right because cpu has a capacity cpu have to go through the more raw cpu have to have some limitations because it cannot handle this kind of transistors because it will get heated up and my cpu is not only used for my uh, compute intensive task but it also used for my other tasks right so i can't keep stacking up on doing this so in 1999 or in 1996 where exactly when this uh, gpu comes into picture graphics comes into picture this is where we understood from the nvidia or in the industry we understood that we need a coprocessor which can offload these things into the processing powers and start doing the processing right so i just wanted to quickly touch about on uh, the history of gpus and how did they evolve in kind of of a thing but why do we look at the history of gpus is by uh, current architectures or decisions own make sense without having a historical uh, perspective right i'll be very quick in looking at these things so, but before going into it i just wanted to have a little vocabulary so uh, three things which i wanted to address going forward is one thing called rendering vertex and pixels so we have used this word extensively it is used in your animation and gaming industry right so we say okay my my things is getting rendering or all the uh, new movies which is happening we have the cg work they say okay rendering takes time and all those things so what is actually this rendering is rendering is nothing but the process of generating an image from a model or you can simply write to draw something on the screen so that is what we call as a rendering kind of a thing and then we call a about vertex vertex is nothing but the corner of a polygon or usually we call as a triangle kind of a thing where the three points x y z coordinates are connected to give you a mathematical operation and then you of course you have a pixel which is a smallest addressable screen in the element so why it actually makes sense so how it even makes sense to a gpu computing is if you see back in the history 
in the animations whenever we see the images in the screen and all those things in the screen what we are looking at is it's a number representation right maybe i can look at the some lion or a tiger in my screen but back end is just a number with different coordinates and number with different color spectrum is what it's presenting over there so all this numbers was able to use this gpus perfectly why because my gpu has something called an arithmetic logical unit which was was developed for doing my arithmetic logical operation compared to the it was having n number of arithmetic logical unit compared to a four core or two core processor which a cpu was happening and when you see the vertices to pixel before gpus how this was happening is this transformation was done by using a gpu a cpu central processing unit and it was computing each pixel by hand in the series and it's very slow process right because uh, let's take an example if i wanted to do one 1 million triangles for 10 pixels per triangle 100 pixels per triangle in four light and four cycles per light computation it is almost 4 billion cycles is what i was able to i need to process and now this 4 billion cycles has to be processed and if if it is going to CPU, then there is a big bottleneck because all are serially yet to be processed in my CPU because it was having one core or only two cores or even four core only assigned for it. So that is where your GPUs came into picture, where in 1990s and 1980s, we came up with something called a fixed pipeline architecture where you will get it host which will be supplying you all the numbers which requires for the graphic computation and then you have something called a vertex control which converts all this graphics into a proper uh, way that hardware will understand and store those things into my vertex cache and then you have vertex shading which will transform this into a lighting conditions and assigns the per vertex value like a color or a, a depth of the image and all those things and then how your rectangle happens and it's create an equation for interpolating your color across the pixel touched by the triangle right and then you're having your rasterization application which will determine which pixel should fall in which triangle kind of a thing and how to interpolate per pixel of the vertices and how your shader works from the final color from the pixel how your raster operation works that is raster operation is nothing but taking your uh, existing things and how you're going to put it the blend of colors overlapping objects or transparency and then then you have something called a FPI where it will use a frame memory, a frame buffer interface where it manages to write, read, write memories and all those things. So this is also was happening in late 80s and 90s. But this is where NVIDIA have done a dramatic role in optimizing a GPU because we understood that, okay, everything is going to be a numbers and these numbers are going to be an independent one. So what I mean by independent one, let's take a animation where, uh, let's take a Tom and Jerry as an example where Tom is going to uh, running behind the Jerry to catch. Now when I'm running behind, when I'm going to do that kind of animation, it is from one vertex, that is from one pixel point, I have to move my Tom to an another pixel point, right? So that is how the running happens. Now the whole thing has to be computed in these cycles. Now since I have whole thing has to be in an independent data because I'm going to extract that for the all uh, matrix values. Now, when I convert this into independent data, now with my general programmability is going to extend to the shader stage, right? where it tends to towards unifying the functionalities of the different stages as application programmer feels. And also main important thing which comes into picture is data independence. So my data independence was the key assumption is GPU, irrespective of what we did on those days in 2001 or in today, 2021, we always assume that data has to be an independent one compared to it. And that's how we arrived to a certain uh, GPU, CPU architecture where it was sharing your vertex core and all those things comes into picture where it was having a unified array for the processor and everything and everyone think was going smooth till 2006 but later how the transformation so till now we were i was just discussing on how this transformation was happening from the background of your 
gaming processing right so now what happens after 2006 were something where gpu computing was coming into picture where i have regularity and mass parallelism that comes into picture because that was a rise of all high performance computation that comes into picture let's say what i mean by high performance computing is let's say i wanted to find the uh, weight of an atom or i wanted to find the experimentation or of an um, uh, physics pendulum or if i wanted to find something in the weather forecast the weather so this is how the whole transformation was happening right the massive amount of data which is even parallelizing data was coming into picture where i needed to do something so that is where we thought that okay what is happening in hpc is we are taking some data points and we are doing some mathematical calculation and when we are arriving at some uh results so if it is going to do a mathematical calculation only why don't we do it in by using a gpu and that was the time when the gpu got evolved into something called a gp gpu that is general purpose graphic processing unit until then it was only for gaming and then was the next sector where it was coming into the general processing graphic processing unit where it was used for multiple uh, computation resources but if i directly put into from my gaming to my uh, hpc that is high performance computing where it can do a mathematical operations i am having lot of problem right because we were not ready for this transition that the problem is how do you communicate to the gpu how your mathematical equation should communicate to the gpu previously i was having the graphics api which was doing but here now i have a mathematical model which is like uh, uh, newton's law i have to do it singer's law i have to do it so that communication how i'm going to do it addressing modes i am i'm to do it that is a size and uh, texture size and dimension of my data which is i'm going to pass to things that is going to be in a problem and uh, the shared capabilities that is how my outputs should be there how many outputs should i get how that resources a problem and instruction set is again a lot of problem right because uh, till now i was having a very specific set of instruction set but now i have uh, something called uh, integer is coming into picture bit operations coming into picture so those things are all needs to be there and more importantly the communication was limited right so previously i just have to flash it and my animation start running now i need my cpu code to do few processing as a serial processing and then i come to my gpus where i have to do the serial processing and all those things are there and user defined data types say i i am defining the data types in fp32 or fp16 or fp64 or in int8 or today we are doing in int4 also that kind of things also comes into picture right so how do we come across the constraints so these are the constraints which we had it in that particular point of a time we have to overcome into the gpu gpu processing but uh, looking back at looking at the development of a hardware or a software cycle it is not only about a software or a hardware that comes into picture right there are a lot of other things which is there apart from this hardware and software that is when i ever get an a hardware where the improvement is needed i i do some hardware testing and i do some of the process in the hardware i put number of cores or i increase the core or increase the memory and i give you a perfect hardware and says that hey this is the state of the art hardware and now to use this hardware yes people now started to write something in the uh some something in the uh, better software kind of a thing they start to write better software where they say okay now i'm able to experience or i can write in a software to the flexibility of the uh, flexibility of uh, things uh, flexibility of the things which is going into much uh, better manner and then when we do those kind of a things again people get used to this kind of a software and where they experiment a lot of things and people start to ask for more improvements in their software and then it goes for the hardware improvement kind of a thing so this is a typical cycle of hardware and software industry right but the problem here comes into picture is it is not only about my software it is also the hardware which is also going to come into picture because when i 
when i prepare in a hardware or when i write a software if there is a bug is there or if when I, when when there is a bug is there or when there is a changes in the process is there then there is going to be a very a problem is going to be there right because it is having something called uh, i cannot update the hardware like uh, i cannot update the hardware like what i'm going to do with my software because if there is a bug is there i can patch i can give a patch we all use a android uh, phones or we use a ios phones where there is some a bug is there we do a patch processing and then we update the patch or the this kind of a things but in a hardware when i do it what is the problem is if there is going to be a bug let's say i have sold this hardware to 100 people or 1000 people have bought this hardware and then i able to find okay that this core is not working this memory is having a bug it's going to be a very difficult because i can't go collect those things i can't have an update i have to prepare a new hardware for it and i have to start doing it right so it is going to have a very uh, difficult task in having this hardware and software integrated now even though when i'm saying that i'm going to have a perfect uh, even though i'm saying that and i'm having a perfect hardware kind of a thing then how i'm going to make my software is going to be an important task as i said i can give you a world class hardware that can come into picture but if my software is not able to do those things then it's going to be a problem so when i do in my software then software cost is going to be a problem right i can't keep designing a software which is going to have a pretty heavy cost MATLAB is one of the best example when we talk about these kind of a software. MATLAB is a very good software. It was used in the education domain. It has all capabilities of doing those things. But the problem is MATLAB is a licensed version, right? So I can't put into a enterprise customers. Let's say today tomorrow I'm going to uh, develop a system where I have to use this kind of a software into my uh, into the direction of doing this. The problem which I'm going to face over here is I can't go to my customer and say that hey I have developed this project and you have paying me this much and I also have something a uh, software which is a MATLAB which is going to cost you as a license. That's going to be a hectic right. So that is how the open source softwares like a TensorFlow or PyTorch started to develop. So this is also going to be a problem right. So how do I write my software is going to be an important thing and second thing is when i redefine my software so to to to, to reduce my cost there are few things which i need to take care of it by making my application more scalable like making my application to use more cores now i can have a hardware which is having 100 cores or 100 cores or even 1000 cores kind of a thing but how do i make it use more cores is going to be a problem how do i make a more threads thread spread core is going to have a problem how do i make to have a more faster more memory into it is going to have a problem and faster interconnect how it is going to interconnect between both both the things is going to have a problem right basically the scalability is going to have a problem in my software also it has to be an application portable right it has to work on the different instruction set i have to work in the arm instruction set i have to work in 86 instruction set it has to work in different instruction set or also from the multi core it has to work right from the gpu to fpga it has to work in those kind of a thing shared and distributed memory it has to work so how do we even make this so is it my only hardware that is gpu is comes into picture or very software when i write it is come to picture how do we actually come across this is one thing we notice not everything is going to be a parallel we cannot have a parallel language or we cannot have a parallel application where we say that hey this is completely going to be my parallel so that i can run it on my gpus or i can run it in the more number of cores it has to be an hetero heterogeneous parallel programming right so heterogeneity is everywhere irrespective of i am using my cpus with more number of cores or if i'm using my fpga or if i using my uh, uh, gpus or if i'm using my neuromorphic chips everything is going to have a certain uh, uh certain kind of a thing right so that's how uh, we'll be using this uh, we'll be using this kind of a process but when we talk about this heterogeneity what exactly we are talking about is we are talking about something called a latency versus a throughput right so what i mean by latency is latency is going to be the time to solution how fast i'm able to get to a solution is a question and second thing is going to be my throughputs right so how much quantities i can take it is the question so which is most powerful or which is more faster in getting the things executed is your cpu central processing unit is only very faster so it's not your gpus it is cpus which are more powerful and which is more processor 
fast enough to do the things but the problem with cpus are it has a limited number of cores so let's say i'm having a four core cpus and if i wanted to train my neural network or if i wanted to train my deep learning algorithms on this four core processor is where this problem happens right so i can't i can't paralyze it i have to use only this four cores so even though it is very faster the number of times the serial operation is going to take is going to be a problem for me or on the other hand i have a gpu which is slower compared to my cpus but the point is i have lot of cores that is arithmetic logical units which can accommodate these amounts of Uh, work schedules or these amounts of things which comes into picture and it can take this in a faster manner right so that's what we call the through the, the la latency versus a throughput the analogy can be given like say i can have my cpus compared to a, a jet pilot kind of a thing and i have my uh, this gpus where i have compared to a big container ships so let's say i wanted to transfer something from here to down south to tamil nadu and i have a tons and tons of things to be transferred even though my jet pilot is very jet file is very fast the number of seat or number of occupancies is going to be very limited so time taken is going to be like a three times or four times or even five times it has to flow from here to fly from here to down south and it has to come whereas in the same time i have lot of places available for my ship where i can put tons and tons in one go and i can do this process in one go so this is what we call as a latency uh, latency versus latency versus uh, throughput right so that is what we are addressing over here so so when we talk about latency versus throughput we are talking from the gpu angle it is not only about the uh, now we are not only talking about the uh, parallel processing but we are talking about heterogeneous parallel processing where we have to attain the latency that is i need the things very faster quicker at the same time i need to give the the throughput in a very faster so if i have 100 request is given to me 100 request should be very faster at the same time i should able to process this 100 request at the same time so that is where we are looking at this latency versus throughput and that is where from the software angle we have to look into these kind of a things that is i have a hardware which is able to do this kind of a faster things but is my software is ready to handle this hardware most efficiently so in every company every soft for companies or every uh, institution there are two types of people right so one is productivity group so productivity group are this data scientists or professors like you or research scientists who write code who write deep learning algorithm to solve particular problem in computer vision or nlp kind of a thing who maintains the whole problem statement by using python scala or those kind of a language where they see themselves as a productivity group they solve the problem but also you have someone called a performance group people. people that is the people like me who works in c c++ or a cuda kind of a, or open cl kind of a language where we are telling that okay uh, you have written a code that is great and doing fine on all those things but the problem is now i wanted to accelerate because i have to maintain this throughput versus latency at the same time so that is where we performance group comes into picture so but how do i make it so is it when i write my software to my ai that is irrespective of ai or hpc when it comes to picture how do i make this kind of a uh, things so the first idea is to uh, uh, how to make it very parallelly go going into the pictures right so the first idea would be that take a right programming language and it can parallelize everything in a straight forward so we have some languages which is programming uh, which is parallel language but it is not that much fast or efficient enough to do the traditional sequential programming right so we can't go with that reliable idea or the second idea i can say that okay what if i design one proper hardware which will whatever you put into it it will do zboomba and it will create everything into a parallel processing and it will start utilizing the whole core of the system and that is also no far achieved we are not able to design that kind of an a hardware kind of a thing and the third thing is where we can say that okay i have a some bottleneck or i have some sequential code and some i have some parallel code where i can write parallel code that can be addressed by some 
special hardware and sequential code can be addressed by a special hardware why don't we combine those things and that is where the two main goals come into picture to maintain the execution speed of the old sequential programs because i have to have my latency into it and second thing to increase the throughput of the parallel processing program so in a code say that i am having a sequential code and a parallel code now i can have my parallel code run in my gpus very faster and my sequential code which cannot be parallel process now can be run in my cpus so heterogeneity is nothing but using gpus and cpus effectively to get that much of performance right and this is what a cpu in gpu looks like if you look at the cpu it has lot of things to do like i have a dram i have a cache i have a control and then i have very limited for arithmetic logical unit but in the same time if you see in my gpus i have lot of cores where the my control and my d uh, control and cache memory is very little for doing the arithmetic logical unit but my question would come like then what if i uh, we can eliminate cpu because i have gpus which is having so much of cores and now it can be performed very well why don't we eliminate my cpu the question the answer for this question would be is it is not easy or it is not possible to eliminate my cpu because my cpu is not only responsible for doing mathematical or a math intensive or a compute intensive task my cpu is responsible for doing other tasks as well as it has to interact with the user it has to it has to i have to i have to play a song in my computer i have to watch a movie in my computer i have to talk to a seminar by using a skype or teams or whatever we have connected today i have to send a mail so everything this has to be processed in a computer i can't think him simply do the mathematical equations so that is the reason why cpus have other responsibilities and it cannot be replaced because gpus having only specific task is to take the parallel code and run it in a all number of codes very powerfully but my cpus has other task like offloading it to my gpus so if you see the how the process in artificial intelligence or anything happens is like i will give my cpus a certain task and it gets offloaded into my gpus and that's how it is going to happen and there are two types of gpus right so one is called your integrated gpus and one is called your uh, discrete gpus so what i mean by integrated gpus is when you have when you are purchasing a laptop then it says when you are having intel processor intel itself has one uh, gpus which is integrated inside it for showing you the graphic processing unit and doing some of the computation work versus you have a discrete gpu that is where you will have intel as well as you will have nvidia cards inside it or a workstation you get it you have extra gpu cards put into it a server you get it you put a, a gpu cards into it that's what we call as a discrete gpu where you are having this kind of a things so is any application is suitable for gpu no because it has to have an independent computation and it has to have a similar computation to make it suitable and of course it has to be a compute intensive tasks let's say i am writing a for loop and let's say i am writing a for loop and i am for 20 uh, times and every 20 uh, every loop Uh, when i'm uh, writing it has to update the value of the previous one irrespective of the irrespective to of it's a for i cannot paralyze this code because it has the dependency issues right so whenever i wanted to make a application suitable for it it has to be an independent and also it has to have the similar computation that happens these two things are very much important in the later we'll see how exactly it is used in my ai uh, kind of a thing so this is a just a glimpse of a gpus where you can see how the architecture of the gpu is there from the host then you have an input assembly then you have this thread execution where you have multiple streaming processing and then you have a streaming processor itself on those things comes in the picture so what would be the ideal thing is i can have a, a cpu as well as gpu both work and hand in hand for doing the process because cpus for a sequential part of the code where now cpus can be 10x faster and the gpus compared to gpus and now i have a parallel processing code which can be again gpus can be 10x pass, faster in handling them because i have lot of throughputs in doing this and to do this which comes 
specifically or help us in doing is something called a CUDA. So CUDA is something called a Compute Unified Device Architecture. It's a it's to be uh, to say that what this CUDA means is CUDA is something you can say as a gateway to communicate to your GPU. So every code you write it, you'll write it in a way that GPU has to understand, and that is how this CUDA comes into picture. So CUDA converts your code into the way the GPUs will work, and it's an extension of C language. It is built on the uh, C, and it 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 directly since it's directly sits on the kernel level operations. Now you are getting more for faster operations or more faster uh, thread is going to happen by using this CUDA tools. And because of the CUDA, CUDA was uh, given by the NVIDIA itself. So because of this CUDA, now communicating to my GPUs will be very much faster. So this is how your birth of GPU computing was happening, right? General processing GPU computing, where you are uh, dealing with the uh, high efficiency floating point integers. And second is you have to have a flow. This is how it has to be having, right? So I have to have a high efficiency floating point integers and I have to have a data parallelism in having these pre-processing number. And then I have a shaders which are fully programmable. I have to have and the hardware cost has to be reduced. I can't keep on adding my uh, GPUs. That thing is there. And I have it should be capable of talking to my GPU. My, my program should be capable of top, talking to the GPUs. And that is how we make a program as very parallel. But coming to today's scenario, so till now we saw that what are the things required for making my uh, GPUs grow faster, right? But how artificial intelligence even use this kind of a technology to go for it is we have to talk a little bit on the present generation of the GPUs. So A100 is something, uh, is a present GPU that is current uh, newest GPU in the market. And this was released in last year, March 2020. And uh, the A100 stands for Ampere Architecture. So A stands for Ampere. It's a kind of an, a micro architecture, which is released from NVIDIA. NVIDIA every two years uh, changes their architecture inside the number of cores and processor gets changed where it can able to handle multiple other computation things. So it is built massively for parallel computation process, specific hardware, software, to manage the deep learning workloads like a tensor cores and mixed precision execution. We'll look at what is these things to manage the software very properly. So that is how the A100 cards comes into picture. And what are the strengths of A100 is, it is not one core, it is not four core, or it is not 10 core. It is 6,912 cores, that is FP32 cores, that is sitting in the A100 kind of a card. Now you can imagine what amount of computations it is going to do right now you have 6000 parallel processes which can run which will dramatically reduces of what you are going to do the training in your cpu let's say you're doing a object detection model training or say you're doing an image classification model training or medical imaging training in your cpu versus or in some uh, initial level uh, GPUs versus a A100 kind of a GPU. Now you can see that computationally it will reduce your time to do this process because it has so much amount of cores of FP32 cores, uh, CUDA cores I'm talking about. And there is if you see the transistor wise, we saw that how in 17, uh, 1970, we were having, we started this journey with 2250 uh, transistor versus today what we are having is 21.1 billion transistors has been embedded into the A100 kind of an architecture. So, but I told so much about GPUs. I have told so much about how GPU was evolved, how HPC was utilizing GPUs and everything. But how exactly my deep learning is going to take a leverage of this uh, GPUs, right? So when we talk about deep learning, you're talking about the learning algorithm, right? So I have a computer task. This is what Mitchell's definition says that, right? With an experience, how your performances of a specific task is going to get improved. So that is what we call as a learning algorithm. And how the learning algorithm looks like is you build a model and then you grab a new data, you test the model if it is check if it is good enough or not. If it is not good enough, then again, you update the model and again, the process go for building the model and doing things. And that is what the typical uh, size of doing it, right? Now, how exactly this happens in my GPU is, how, or how I can ask question, how A100 is so good in doing this machine learning or deep learning kind of a things is, or what is we are going to do with this, this much amount of 
uh, course that is i said na uh, 9000 6912 amount of course so what we'll do is yes we are going to execute things in parallel so when i say execute things in parallel it is going to be an unsatisfactory answer right so what we are exactly executing things in parallel of the ml workloads let's take a typical example let's take a mnist as a example let's say mnist starts from 0 to 783 a uh, pixel that comes and let's say i'm having two layers of neural network or end layers of neural network and finally i have an output layer where it throws out the probability whether this uh, the given image is 5 or 4 or whatever it wanted to do it now we discussed in the previous slides that can i what is a specific basic criteria to make any application suitable for a gpu is it should be independent of operation and second thing is should be a similar kind of an operation so what we exactly do in artificial intelligence in an individual neuron in a deep learning is we have individual neuron which does something called an uh, affine which which something called an affine transformation and then we do something called an activation function that comes into picture so every neuron is going to do the same thing right so i have hundreds of let's say i'm having the layer 1 which is going to have 100 neuron and the layer 2 which is having again 250 number of neurons this every neuron is going to do the same kind of an operation of affine transformation and activation function and since it is fully connected neural network every every neuron is connected to every other neuron where the operation is getting uh, operation is getting repeated or operation is same but the problem is we have 100 million or even billions of parameters that is operation that is into operation and plus operation to be handled right so i have uh, 100 neurons which is has to be communicated with another 100 neurons where the weights has to be transferred and then my bias has to be there so all these things then my gradient comes into picture back propagation happens all these things have going to consume millions and millions uh, of this operations that's going to come right and this all are mat- matrix multiplication operation you have 2d matrix multiplication and then you have a 3d matrix multiplication you have a tensor kind of a matrix multiplication that is when you are doing a video data you have a fourth dimension that comes into picture so the matrix multiplication is literally eating the world so that much amount of resource has been used in literally eating the world so let's take a simple example of what i mean let's say i am having uh, for the uh, example sake let's say i am having 256 uh, input values and then i have a weight corresponding to this 256 input values and i am taking only one single neuron to do this process so x into w is what we generally do in a fine transformation where uh, input and the weight is multiplied and we arrive at some results how this actually happens in back end is let's say i'm having a single threaded execution let's say i'm having only one processor at a time now the first Uh, comes and multiplied into 0.1 and it gives you some results and now that has to be processed and it has to go for the next result so the storage gets stored and then again the second processing happens again a second instruction set should go and the store this should be stored again third instruction set fourth instruction set likewise the instruction set should happen one by one by one so it is single threaded process so if i have to do the single threaded process for 256 values it is 256 instructions has to be processed or 256 times this has to be done at the same point and this 256 into some delta time right so it is let's say 1 second 10 second whatever seconds is going to be the total execution for this pro- for this neuron to get it completed this i'm talking only about one neuron uh, by the way but now and then i come to the gpu execution when i'm having the 6917 uh, 6912 cuda cores how this transformation happens is every uh, every multiplication or every individual neuron now go take one core and do the processing so i'm no longer get associated with single threaded process now i'm going something called a multi threaded that is parallel threaded process everything that happens in single go and now when you see the execution time of everything that is 256 will happen at the same time and the time it is going to take is going to be only a delta t so the total thing of course i have to have the back propagations done so that i have to have the gradients 
coming into picture so i have to combine this 256 will be combined into 128 128 and again that is getting is getting broken into 64 64 and then i get the final coordination system which is total of let's say a log of 128 if i'm going to get it is seven times the delta t right so seven times already we i have a multiple execution for one time the seven time is for back propagation updation so totally eight into uh, eight times into delta t versus 256 a time into delta t so this is what the power of things we are looking at as two different entities altogether so you could see that the comparison of why GPU even come into today picture is when I'm able to reduce from 256 into delta T to 8 into delta T is where the magnitude gets changed or where I'm getting the speed in my artificial intelligence. But I have this much amount of cores. As I said in my earlier uh, slide, now I have given you the best state of the heart hardware where it has all the capabilities. It has 6,000 plus CUDA cores. It has tensor cores. It has all beautiful things. But as I said, it is not always the hardware that has to be evolved. It is also the software, better software that needs to be wrote, uh, written so that my process, this both collectively will give you a world-class AI product. So architecture-wise, I have all the GPUs which comes into picture. Let's say I'm doing the inferencing from the Tesla cards or I can have a supercomputers like a DGX supercomputer system or I can work for my visualization task or AR VR task. I can have a Quadro GPUs and everything or I have, in, have an edge computing kind of a thing where I have a Jetson uh, kind of a devices for doing the inferencing. So architecture-wise, we are having the best. But now coming back to software-wise, how do we even have a best software kind of a thing? And that is where we as an NVIDIA company contribute to the software as well as. So software is something when we talk about every major framework, let's say I wanted to have my framework in TensorFlow, I wanted to use PyTorch or even Mat MATLAB, which is a licensed one. Even in MATLAB, I can now have an NVIDIA SDK software development toolkits for used to address these kind of a things. Now I can make my software also efficient enough. I can write my software also in efficient enough to do this process from every verticals, irrespective of computer vision, speech or audio time series or natural language processing. But the problem is it is not only about software, it is also about the massive amount of computing where it has to take place. As I said, from autonomous driving to astrophysics, genomics, medical data, or even in the weather prediction, nuclear fission, we have to do it. And we have different kinds of roles, right? We have in industry, you have a data scientist and researchers who are trying to solve a particular problems. Then you have a developers that is machine learning engineers who are trying to build the code in doing, and then you have an admin people who are trying to maintain the whole system kind of a things so different goal uh, roles but uh, they all have a same goals that is how to make my system faster time to solutions how do i complete my research in a very fast manner how do i ask so much students that is 100 students if i'm hosting i'm having a computer vision class how much how how can a 50 60 students or 20 30 students can communicate uh, to the same gpus in a very faster time and all those things how fast i can do it that is where better execution of the program comes into picture we have something called the ngc so what i mean by ngc this is where we are concentrating on our software development skills also so ngc stands for NVIDIA GPU Cloud. So NVIDIA GPU Cloud is not a cloud. It's not a typical cloud which we hear outside. It's just a repository. So it's like a GitHub. It is a repository. And what this repository is capable of doing is it has the Docker container because today world everything has been dockerized everything has been containerized so it will have a docker optimized docker container to use it and to do these things and what all there in the ngc kind of an architecture is now i have 50 plus containers that comes into picture of doing this this containers will have uh, tensorflow this containers will have pytorch environment this containers will have uh, all your all the major frameworks that picks into comes into picture is where your containers comes into containers will come into picture and then you have your model script and pre-trained models so uh, Artificial intelligence is not only about building a data, right? So I don't need to reinvent the wheel when I already have something called a pre-trained models. I 
just do a transfer learning and then i can do the processing but now this transfer learning whatever i do from let's say i'm taking an inception network or let's say i'm taking the uh, uh, or something in the google uh, object detection api or a yolo or a ssd kind of a thing should be optimized enough to handle my gpus properly i can write a code but the code writing capabilities is different from person to person right so how do i effectively use this gpu properly is where our ngc comes into picture. where we have pre-trained models and industry workflows for like a medical imaging kind of a specific task tools artificial uh, intelligent video analytics specific tools video analytics specific tools or uh, let's say uh, data science specific tools that comes into picture where you can write these things in a very faster manner or in a very efficient manner where you can use these kind of a containers and why containers why can't i use a bare metal server is containers simplifies your deployment process right so it makes your life very simpler it is not getting uh, it is it will makes your life very simpler it is not been like multiple people are not using your containers and uh, uh, it 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 will it will make your product more portable and scalable compared to what you write in a bare metal server right and institutions like uh, uh, colleges like you let's say i'm having a lab session i want to conduct and where i have uh, uh, say 20 or 30 people coming into picture and i'm coming i'm asking them to do a different kind of a task in artificial intelligence everyone is going to install uh, some frameworks right so one person can install uh, tensorflow one person can install pytorch kind of a thing and this container is nothing but like a virtual environment that gets uh, that gets installed in these things so that your workflows can be accessed in a very faster manner compared to what you are having in those things so that is why the reason why we go into the container and why specifically ngc container as i said ngc is given from nvidia directly we know what gpus you are going to use because my container will have looking for a specific gpus so we are the producers of gpus now we know what program we are writing so we write the software in a such a manner that it effectively uses the hardware and gives me the result out so that is where we talk about ngc containers that comes into picture or redesigning the enterprise or hpc environment and run it anywhere you can run it in your jetson devices you can run it in your nvidia supercomputer you can run it in other devices where this comes into picture and it has 50 plus containers in the ngc repository from 10 the flow pi torch or from machine learning point of view you have those things from the inferencing point of view you have uh, uh, you have those things comes into picture hpc genomics visualization everything comes into picture right so this is what we talk about uh, ngc kind of a container and also we are doing something not only in the uh, hardware side as i said we are continuously doing the framework from the software side we keep on increasing our uh, we keep on uh, doing the updates in our software side so that it gives you the best performance when you're doing it in our gpus where it uses to do it so what is the best way to accelerate your code is instead of writing your code on a bare metal server instead of installing a tensor flow and then putting your code inside the tensor flow and building a model now you can use an ngc container of tensor flow and you can just have to put your code over there now since the tensor flow which is opti or optimized by ngc now it will give you the best better performances compared to a bare metal server where you have installed a uh, tensor flow or a pytorch or whatever framework on your own so that is what nvidia uh, ngc is all about and next i quickly wanted to touch about on okay let's say i'm i now i've i have i've written a code let's say i've written a code for computer vision i have written a code for nlp kind of a task and now i have 800 kind of a gpus which is having 6000 plus things i have also used uh, ngc container as where i have converted my code into the uh, where i have converted my code into the uh, uh, converted my code into uh, the uh, where it can give you the best performances on all those things but the point is is it over is it like can we put it inside the code and it will give you the performance of uh, awesome magic is it end of end over there it is not 
it is it is not only yes of course it will give you the best performances compared to uh, what a unoptimized code was there but more importantly you can go further with nvidia's sdks so we have multiple ways where you can accelerate your uh, your code by using gpus by using our specific ND sdks and that is what we wanted to uh, uh, i wanted to talk about in this thing that is end to end deep learning workflow that is from my pre trained model to my training adoption and ready to integrate is where i have some end to end integrated model which we have so we have a pre trained model repository where you can do a transfer learning to this pre trained model repository you do not need to train from scratch and also you can optimize it and retrain it get it adapted to a scene adaptation kind of a thing which you can get adapted to your uh, neural network and then you can do the model output now the whole output will be very faster that comes into picture and then you put it to the inferencing platform now the inferencing platform again is going to be a best inferencing platform because we have softwares written for this inferencing platform to give you the best result compared to what a bare metal server comes into picture so one such software is something called dali what this dali uh, uh, writes what this dali does is it will eliminate the gpu bottleneck for the dl workloads mainly used in your imaging uh, technologies that is your whenever you're dealing with image data or video kind of a data this is how it is doing so because in a typical uh, cpu what is going to happen is i'm going to load a data and then i'm going to decode the data i'm going to resize my images augment my images and then only it goes to my training kind of of a thing but when i when we see the pipeline kind of a thing the loading data decoding data resizing augmentation everything happens in the cpu thing but only training happens in my gpu so this is a bottleneck right so when i when i have this much capable of gpus why can't i push this decoding resize and augmentation from the uh, cpu to my gpu kind of a sources that is where dali comes into picture dali is a fully uh, input pipeline accelerated including the data loading and augmentation techniques which will completely work shift all your workloads which you are using in cpu to the gpu and now your resizing or a decoding or a data augmentation now happens in gpus which means that you are able to get the faster results and it is integrated with your tensorflow pytorch mxnet kind of an a chainer kind of an architectures where it does do this and it even supports resnet 50 ssd and all major frame all major pre trained network which can be furthermore used by using a dali so this by this you can able to reduce your training time because now your whole processes are at least 70 to 80% of the process now happening in your gpu workflows and next we have something called a mixed precision kind of a thing what i mean by mixed precision is generally we do our uh, training in neural network by using fp64 or sorry fp32 kind of a precision right so when i use an fp32 kind of a precision the memory it is going to take more and also the time consumption is going to take more because i when i wanted to do a multiplication of two fp32 and fp32 kind of a product is two fp32 bit is getting uh, Uh, multiplied right so that is going to be a training layer where your memory is going to be more but in automatic mixed precision what we say that is you have an fp32 and also you have fp16 kind of a thing and you will able to do the training by using a reduced precision that is called that is by integrating fp32 and also fp16 kind of a precision and which can be accelerated by using gpus that is specifically by using something called a tensor cores which is present inside the gpu in the hardware level and this kind of computations can be fastened by using these things and most importantly without loss of accuracy you are able to get this mixed precision done so let's say i have trained my model and i it was giving me 92% of accuracy in this much amount of a time fp32 or a mixed precision kind of a thing also gives you that much amount of accuracy training accuracy in a very lesser time because now we are not using only fp32 we have an integrated it with fp16 also and uh, as i said tensor cores is something a uh, specific things which is built on the gpus 
which can accelerate my workloads in a very faster manner mainly in the four cross four matrix kind of a thing where i have uh, four uh, four cross one matrix can be multiplied now in a single set of instruction let's say i am so now the whole fp16 or fp32 fp16 kind of a things where it is either it is addition or whether it is a multiplication now can be handled by a different core altogether which is going to give you a faster performances compared to what you had in your previous thing so that is also something you can do it and this is a benchmarks you are able to get it like how faster the mix precision was able to rise up and how faster it was able to give it without losing any accuracies in that kind of a thing so that is what we are uh, seeing the model accuracy when you go for mix precision it is almost equal or if you lose also it going to be it's almost equal you're not you're not going to lose the accuracy even though if you're going to lose the accuracy it's going to be a very minimal kind of an accuracy which can be ignored kind of a thing so this is one second thing which we are doing from the software point of view third we have something called a nvidia metropolises it's a intelligent ai a video analytics software mainly we use it for uh, uh, smart cities because when i'm dealing with smart cities uh, kind of a uh, 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 when when we are doing a smart city kind of a thing smart city kind of a projects now what we are looking into this is we are not on we have to train it from the scratch right uh, so when i'm uh, when i'm doing it uh, from the training from the scratch kind of a thing it is going to take lot of time for me to do this kind of a process so from the transfer learning toolkit to the deep stream which i'm going to get it it's going to have a process which is getting involved because i have to train my data i have to collect my data and i have to do lot of computation kind of a thing so this is where nvidia metropolis comes into picture it has something called the transfer learning toolkit where you have a data converters where you can put your uh, code into your data into it it has a scene adaptation techniques which will train it will prune the networks and it will tune it according to what present data you have and then you can take it to a deep stream kind of an environment where deep stream is your analytics video analytics platforms now that can be handled multiple streams can be handled by using nvidia gpus where you are getting the faster things and all those things and it's a analytics software also right you are getting the real time analytics of your video data also so this is one thing we do in nvidia metropolises as a sdks and finally we have something in a healthcare and we have done a lot of work in healthcare for the past 10 years where we have started from 2017 2007 to 2008 where the clara comes into picture lot of innovations have been happening in healthcare lot of uh, uh, pro lot of uh, codes we have written mainly the present which we are working is something called nvidia clara which is having something called an automatic segmentation of the medical images so you don't need to work much on your annotation of the data you don't need to work on the segmentation part it can automatically do the segmentation for you when you're doing with uh, when you're do dealing with multiple uh, medical imaging kind of a thing so it supports up to uh, 14 to 15 organs of automatic uh, uh, segmentation kind of a thing it has that pre trained algorithm which is already running and when we talk about medical data it is not a 2d data right it's 3d data of things the volumes of data needs to be processed and that can be easily uh, done all those things and now you have something called a you know, for deployment is also going to be very easy because you are having something called a clara deploy which will use the deploying manager and make your system go faster so this also can be done or say rapids rapids is one of the sdks where we use for data scientist machine learning processing all your pandas or numpy which is all are compute intensive and which is a cpu dependent now can be converted into a gpu dependent you can accelerate by using a gpus by using rapids kind of a thing so that is also possible and finally we have something called a tensor rt kind of an workflows where you can tra take your trained model which is trained by using some gpus or some cpus you can take that trained model and now you can do a faster performances in using this uh, uh, in using this trained model by using something called a tensor rt tensor rt is nothing but it optimize your trained model without touching the math of it that is it will after the model is being trained and then give you a better performances and it can run on any gpu platforms 
so these are the things which we look at the from the sdk way kind of a thing right so uh, as i said it's it's about writing it was it's about having the perfect gpu as well as perfect uh, software is coming into picture so i should have a perfect hardware that's where we are uh, a100 comes into picture and then i have something called a perfect uh, gpus where are uh, perfect uh, software sorry a perfect software where we have abundance of sdks which having so much of functionality which comes into picture i highly recommend you people to go and search for the nvidia sdks and use it for your use cases wherever you are using we have lot of sdks lot of ngcs that we have which for every use cases we have done something and we have used it but coming back okay we have now we have solved the problem we have lot of uh, sdks we have we have lot of uh, 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 we have 800 kind of a gpus which is having 6000 plus cores and we have everything done but what about uh, is it enough to achieve the ai performances is a question mark right because as i said the network size and database size is getting increased day by day it's a old uh, example but it is also it is enough to see how fast the network size has been increased in 2015 this is an imagenet resnet competition which was having 7 exaflops of 60 million parameters and in 2 years in 2016 when the uh, neural uh, machine translation from google came it was having 100 exaflops and 8700 million parameters which is need to be utilized so if you see the network size also increased at the same time data set size has been increased dramatically right and also today after the gpt 3 comes into picture we are looking at the massive amount of uh, uh, the compute which is going to happen and how do we handle this massive amount of compute because when i wanted to do this 100 exaflops of things in a dual cpu server it will take 2 years for me to complete one experimentation so that is the that is a computation which we are looking for it so not a single a100 card can have it but how fast we can have more number of training how how cluster kind of a things can or how faster or how efficient a system should be to handle this kind of things because uh, alex did was trained on two gpus for five to six days and then you have a noisy student which was of 2019 was trained on one k that is 1000 tpus for 7 days so that is going to be a problem right so i i can't keep training on this much amount of gpus and gpus kind of a things i need something much bigger which is able to do it and that is where we have something called or uh, something which we have to make it the iteration time go very much lesser and where we are able to solve this problem and that is where we come to something called a dgx a100 supercomputers so dgx a100 red super computer is a compute is a super computers which is completely owned developed by nvidia and it is an end to end complete stack it is one system for every ai workloads you are going to use and it's an integrated and it is giving you an unmatched ai expertise performances and it is game changing performance we are going to see and the performance is five petaflops of ai this is huge right so you are able no supercomputers in the world at presently gives you five petaflops of ai performances and in ops it gives 10 ops of performance that is your know, integer performance comes in the 10 ops of integer performance so this is going to be a very game changing right when you're doing which when you're dealing with so much amount of data when you're dealing with so much amount of uh, uh, so much amount of Uh, data as well as with the model size and now the question comes to uh, most of the people is hey i i don't have that much amount of data or most of the institutions which is present over here is we don't have that much amount of data we don't have that much amount of model size maybe we are trying to learn ai maybe we are trying to do experiment in ai our students wanted to do experiment in ai where we are trying to teach them how to do perform ai on all those things but we do why do we need this kind of an architecture so that is because we are this kind of when you when you say that you wanted to teach this things to your students where the students wanted to uh, go through all the ai things and will wanted to get uh, exposed to all these things and that is where this a100 perfectly fit your students because 
in a single gpu only one person can access the time whereas in a 800 kind of a gpu it's like 56 people can access the 800 kind of a gpus at the same time so it is a one system for all because it has something called a multi instance gpu which is nothing but your gpu now can be sliced up to seven instances previously i can have only one gpu one person using that gpus and he will completely occupy my gpus i cannot slice the gpu into different segments but now i can slice the gpus like 5 gb 10 gb 20 gb into different segments and i can give it to the students and i can have multiple students working let's say i am having a lab of 50 students or 40 students where i have to take a lab session for them in a single batch now i can have everyone connected to the single system and everyone can start using the CPU, GPU at same point of a time where they get dramatic improvement in their performance and also they get the hands-on performance on this game-changing uh, performance and also the model building. So everyone can accommodate, everyone will be able to accommodate as well as they were able to experience or appreciate the new technologies which is coming forward. So that is where your A100 come or a DGX kind of a system that comes into picture because it has eight A100 uh, uh, GPUs, that is a tensor core GPUs, which A100, which was we spoke previously, and the total memory is of 320 uh, GB of NVIDIA's, that is GPU memory is what we are talking about. And as I said, performance-wise, it is five petaflops of AI and for 10 petaflops of AI performance that comes into picture. And uh, again, for CPUs, we, as we said, it is always going to be a CPU-GPU combinations. We have, uh, you know, we have joined our hands with the AMD processor for this GPUs where you are getting 128 cores of total GPUs and 1 TB of uh, RAM memory you're going to have and 15 TB of storage is going to have. So in this, what is a great thing about doing is, as I said, it can be sliced into seven instance and uh, I can run a lot of things in the seven instance in one GPU. Now in one GPU, I can have two TensorFlows can be hosted, three PyTorch can be, uh, three Jupyter notebooks I can host, one inferencing model I can host and also I can have a uh, one HPC model I can host. So this kind of things I can do it. And the question for the, the question would be like, what if I don't have this much amount of model, but the same thing, I have a lot of people who wanted to connect to my system. And now I can give this seven instance and seven people at the time can communicate to my systems. And that is where the flexibility happens by using this something called a multi-instance GPU, how far and how fast we can use it. So as if it's like you can use four GPUs for your training and two GPUs you can use for your data analytics or two GPUs you can use for inferencing or all seven can be used, all eight can be used for your training and multiple students can communicate to it and doing this. And performance wise, what changes have been happened is since it is a new architecture altogether compared to a previous generation architecture that is Volta V100, it is six times or 122 times performance wise it has increased right let's say i wanted to train a bert language it is 6x performance compared to its previous generation v100 from from nvidia side and when you compare it to a cpu server it is like 10 peta ops of performance that is 172x times you are getting the peak performances for your inferencing kind of a performance and in analytics of course say compared to a cpu gpu uh, cpu cluster now you are able to get 13x performances by using djx 800 and these numbers are very crazy right so you are able to get this much amount of performance in doing these kind of uh, 800 kind of a thing and finally you have something called a DG expert who comes with a DGX kind of a supercomputer kind of a thing who helps you to work with you from directly from the NVIDIA he sits in Santa Clara and the, the they, they work with you they work with your projects if you're facing any difficulties they sit with you and they train your projects and do the things and that is the reason why we are uh djx can be a complete solution for the colleges or the education institutions like you because you don't need to have a headache of maintaining it it is a complete each stack and it can be maintained. It has its own software stacks, which is optimized and it can be used very effectively. But now after training it, we have to go for edge processing, right? So that is where our Jetson comes into picture. That is from DGX. Now I have to go for edge processing where I wanted to do robotics, where I wanted to have a lesser bandwidth, where I wanted to work in many 
a similar example like a smart city or a facial recognition app or say uh, object detection which i wanted to create and i wanted to show those things and that is where your edge comes into picture so we have amazing product lines that is our uh, something called uh, jetson devices where jetson is a small embedded computer which ai supercomputer which is used for this ai inferencing it's just like your uh, uh, it is a it's a bad terminology to say this but it is actually that's that's how we can uh, make people understand it is like your raspberry pi now has a gpu on top of it now you can expect that how computationally faster your things can be and the size is going to be similar of your raspberry kind only so that is where our jetson boards comes into picture and we have something called jetson nano which is uh, a least ai inferencing the last uh, the smallest model in the ai inferencing engine which we have which is having 4 gb of ai uh, uh, that is gpu memory and where it can host which is used for your multiple inferencing techniques and it comes in two form factor that is in a 4 gb of memory and 2 gb of memory and 2 gb of memory is just 9 uh, $59 only right so it is very affordable also to the people who wanted to use this jetson nano for their final year projects so you can you can actually uh, encourage your students to use this kind of a jetson nano in their final year projects because this will bring them Uh, the recruiters who is coming to your uh, office or your uh, colleges will, will the projects which they have done is what is going to get evaluated by these recruiters, right? So when the people are started to use this kind of GPUs in their projects in their pipeline, is where your students will get more exposure to this kind of an architecture, right? So that is where your Jetson Nanos or these kind of things, and of course it's affordable. The, the, there is no much difference between the Raspberry Pi three and a Jetson Nano. Which is two GB is fifty nine dollars. So it is more like you can uh, get it and you can experiment with it, and all those things can happen. And the performance is also very good, right? When you are doing inferencing, you can see the ResNet fifty. It gives around forty. Uh, to 35 to 40 images per second of inferencing bandwidth is you are getting in the jetson nano whereas if you are using a raspberry pi you know that your jets your resnet 50 will not even sit or will not even get accommodated in your uh, raspberry pi kind of an environment things and you can get multiple stream this is what i called about nvidia's uh, deep stream where you can now host multiple streams in single jetson nanos so it has eight streams now you can use it by a single jetson nano so of multiple streams can be used and multiple models can be used these are the ways or techniques where you can have highly efficient uh, deep learning models which can give you the best results compared to what you are doing in the inferencing and this video is taken from the nano which we are using which i have used and you can see that multiple streams are happening seamlessly very faster compared to a single stream that is can happen in my uh, gpu that, that is in my raspberry pi so jetson family has these kind of series you have your jetson then you have a jetson tx2 uh, jetson xavier nx and jetson ax i would suggest that if you are beginner in ai and if you wanted to experiment something uh, in the if you want to have some uh, flavor of gpus and you wanted to experiment something i would suggest you to go with jetson nano it is just uh, in cost wise also it is very less uh, price and in the performance wise you will be getting the flavor of uh, the ai where you can get these things very quickly done and jetson nanos can be given you the perfect blend of these things and that can also be possible by using this things so you can uh, try it if you wanted to try it and then you can use it so i was speaking uh, for last uh, one one and a half hours we were speaking about how ai has evolved how gpu came into picture and uh, how well you can use your gpus for the task or what is a dgx kind of supercomputer why supercomputer is even required and uh, also we talked a little bit on the jetson inferencing kind of a thing right so we we, we spoke about all these things but uh, is it that's all like uh, what extra can happen so this all i was covering from the angle from the topic of your uh, how nvidia have contributed from a gpu kind of a thing in hardware and software but we have one more section which we do with the colleges and institution higher education and research institution and that is where we do something called as an academic collaboration from the nvidia side so 
what we call it is it's happening right so everywhere as i said ai has gone into the roots and everywhere and we want to help the community by collaborating with uh, the faculties in setting up the ai center of excellence in the institutions where with the ai gpus from nvidia gpus kind of a thing and we collaborate with them because uh, these are the, what we mean by center of excellence is so we have a partnership a collaboration with the certain universities and where we jointly address the students in generating or uh, in working in the in the process of uh, creating uh, ai courses course curriculum and all those things and creating an infra kind of a thing so that the students who are in their first year second year third year or fourth year or a phd students or mtech students get the flavor of what industry is looking forward because we come from industry and we know how well this has been used so uh, so what is industry is looking forward is where we are coming from this architecture wise and we do this kind of collaboration and we have done in many uh, collaboration many places that is uh, in many universities we have done and at the end of the slide i'll go go through something and all these collaborations we have done and specifically we have something called nvidia deep learning institute and what we mean by nvidia deep learning institute it is a uh, it is a online courses which we uh, offer to the people outside where which we target on the specific divisions that is from the fundamentals of deep learning to the specific like in a computer uh, computing fundamentals or the data science specific things or very specific task like for ai for anomaly detection autonomous vehicle healthcare or robotics kind of a thing is where we cover in by using in our deep learning institute kind of a thing so when we go to some institutions like you and we say that nvidia is doing an academic collaboration and what we actually mean is we wanted to enhancing the dl research projects and or uh, the key focusing ai as this in the institution we are facilitating or co-inventing with the industries you work with our team that is nvidia team and how well you as students can do workshops we conduct and all those things we have as i said we have this deep learning institute and most importantly you will get access to our dli ambassador program so what is this dli ambassador program is and we India has something called this Deep Learning Institute Ambassador Program, where the the criteria for it is to be you should be a teaching uh, per, per person. That is, you have to be a professor, assistant professor, and all those things. So now you uh, write back to us telling that you are capable of teaching the programs which NVIDIA is having. So if you are capable of writing uh, teaching the uh, AI programs or machine learning or deep learning kind of a courses, so you can write back to us where we. we certify you or we will have an certain exams and based on merit you get certified as a dli ambassador and having this dli ambassador what is a good thing you going to have is you going to get all the lecture materials and presentation and exercise lab and quiz and all those things as a free of cost where you can take it to your students and you can start teaching and also you will be certified as a dli ambassador from nvidia side and then that process also can happen and all those things can happen very well and also we um, uh, when we collaborate with the institutions like this we we uh, what kind of collaboration we look at the academics institution is by facilitating their lab on the need basis and we will assign a lead faculties academic researchers we will teach the researchers on how the industry is looking forward because we are not going to teach the professors about artificial intelligence or a neural network whereas we teach teach the professors on the sdks which we are talking about how well you can use the gpus how well you can write your code by using the gpus so that your students who is going to get engaged with you in your class or in this uh, uh, this kind of a collaboration activities will be able to know what industry is looking towards and then we goes out the placement will be very easier compared to what is having right now because right now everyone have started to use ai right so those kind of a things can be done and what are the deliverables we can uh, do from nvidia as you can brand a, you can brand nvidia name for your center you can use us as an official partner and you can have your logo printed with the, you can have use our logo for this nvidia thing and we will set up the required technologies from the and facilitate the technologies for a gpu docker kubernetes and all those things hpc kind of an architecture and 
we shall uh, facilitate the training of the new gpu technologies tools which is getting updated we will conduct the workshops for you we will we will ha have an a hands on uh, research workshops and all those things and also we collaborate for the research papers where we collaborate with the professors in solving the uh, specific problem set and we give you exposed to our uh research communities and we also put you across our research places where you can present your papers and do all those things and all those things can happen with the collaboration now the question comes is why do colleges need should go for academic collaboration right so the the answer for this what i would give you is all certification courses which is in the online platform let's say udemy coursera and all those things they are only to a maximum intermediate level right so because they 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 teach okay what is artificial intelligence and how to code in uh, keras and everything but that's no longer a skill right people are looking for much more important skills than plainly knowing what is an artificial intelligence there is no industry standard practice is there so by collaborating with us we give you the industry standard practices we will teach you how to do this because since we come from the industry and we are the industry leaders and this collaboration not only help the students in understanding the theory but also it helps giving them the exposure to a gpu supercomputer world right so research guidance industry standard contents and all the project assistance will be taken care from the nvidia and the course itself will be taught by nvidia and the uh, experts from nvidia and wintech in the data science domain machine learning engineering robotics and gpu computing and computer computer science kind of a things where we teach people how to use their gpus or we teach people how to do the robotics kind of a thing what industry is looking for that's what we are doing and also government is promoting ai in a big time right so you 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 see all startups is getting promoted more than what mnc is getting promoted in india because of the make in project make in india projects and all Uh, government official companies are now converted into uh, ai computing or ai need for those kind of a things that is also getting promoted by government and there are a lot of research money that the, the funding gets allocated for the from the government for doing this ai kind of an uh, uh, pro programs right so that is also going to be an uh, also important and when you communicate with us since we are dealing with supercomputers your students get more uh, knowledge about nvidia supercomputer which is a demand in the job market today and uh, this not only as i said the knowledge is not only going to be applied in coding field but also in the different various topics like hpc healthcare biotechnology and other critical domains by doing this and also more importantly you will be knowing how to take your models from lab to the production what is the end to end cycle how an industry workflows work is going to be the skills because these are the collaborations which we are looking forward to have these things and i'll just quickly run over the collaborations which we have and then we can break for uh, q&a so this is one collaboration which we recently have done from with the central uh, electronics and engineering research institution siri and nvidia we have done for their uh, uh, hpc kind of a setup and artificial intelligence kind of a lab and then we have it for iit jodhpur where we have uh, signed up for a uh, setting up their facilities for by using the supercomputer networks and all those things and also we have for iit hyderabad to do it and uh, abdul kalam university technical universities and uh, iit bombay we also have the uh, things getting installed and uh, workshops from the sidac and also getting installed and we have uh, around 300 plus colleges universities research institutes where this large scale nvidia gpu platforms are used today right and in your very own city that is sidac is going is having the highest number of a supercomputer cluster in india because it is having 42 supercomputers which is hosted in your sidac and many more to come for facilitating for all the research activities across the india so these kind of uh, collaboration we do it and also we have done collaboration with uh, uh, in in pune itself we have done collaboration with uh, uh, simba ss uh, university uh, coep university and all we have done the collaboration from the department level so department level collaborations or the institution level collaborations can happen or even in the individual professor level collaborations also if all this comes in the merit right so you you send a request and then we evaluate and for research collaborations that all happens in the merit
So these are the different collaborations which we have made in the past where we have helped the students, we have helped the organizations to grow their journey in AI and help them to nurture them in from the industry point of view, how you wanted to go and all those things. We, this all information is present in our website. Please do visit our website and also as telling that uh, we are almost end of the slide. I would say that after these things, please do visit uh, the NVIDIA's SDKs, understand and how the NVIDIA's SDKs is working. If you are having the GPU computing uh, facilities, please do use GPU computing facilities. If you are having any uh, struggle in using those things, please write it, uh, write us back. I may personally help you. Or if you wanted to have any collaborations, if your colleges want to have any collaborations with NVIDIA, please do let us know that I can take it forward. I'll give my mobile uh, number and uh, email ID. You can contact me regarding artificial intelligence uh, or a technical discussion regarding artificial intelligence or from the GPU point of view or from collaborating point of view also can be managed. So uh, that's all from my side. I'm open for Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, we can go for it. Participants, you can unmute yourself and can ask questions and uh, you can also post it in the chat box. Uh, Haryaran sir, there's one question in the chat box. Uh, yeah, please. Sir Kiran Kamra is asking. Hmm? We have V100 system. Uh, is possible to replace with DGX100? Okay. Uh, so V100 systems, I want to understand whether it is in your servers or how it is. Is it uh, is it an individual cards that is uh, sitting in your uh, uh, in your server or it is it it's is a hardware? He's saying it's hardware. It's hardware. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm saying here is uh, there is a DJX uh, comes in the two form factors. So the DJX was coming from V100 point of view and DJX can comes from A100 point of view. Yes, of course, you can replace your cards with your A100 uh, kind of cards. Or if you are having a server kind of an architecture, you can get an individual cards and you can put it. Or if you're looking for a DJX kind of a thing, maybe you can uh, replace it by using uh, getting a DJX a supercomputer itself. So maybe if you can send me few details about your existing setup, uh, I could help you better. Maybe you can forward it to the mail ID which I have uh, shown you in the screen. I can, uh, I, can, I can help you better in knowing your architecture. So one more question is there. Uh, mm -hmm. If I want to implement an image processing project, which tool should I prefer? By okay. Okay. Uh, tools in the sense he's. I think so. Uh, I, I, he, are you referring to the frameworks? Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself and. Uh, you can ask. Yes, yes it's the same. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm referring to frameworks, uh, we have to just understand about why frameworks comes into picture. So frameworks mainly used for the flexibility of how you wanted to code into it. So PyTorch or TensorFlow or Keras have the same kind of architecture or it communicates same way to the GPUs. But only thing is how flexible it's enough to do it in this. There is no specific uh, tools or no, there is no specific operations which can work very well in this. It is just a comfort level you can do it. So if you are a beginner, I would suggest that you can get into a Keras kind of an architecture where it's in a high level API. Now TensorFlow 2.0 also have an integrated Keras. So you can start from TensorFlow 2.0 where it is having all your dynamic processing comes into picture. But once if you're very good with uh, uh, TensorFlow 2.0 or a KRS kind of arc, uh, framework, and if you wanted to have more flexibility from the architecture point of view, that is from your uh, coding style or from those things, you can get into your PyTorch or from the research point of view, if you wanted to address, you can get into your MXNet. But irrespective of which uh, framework you use if for a uh, for a specific task uh, or if you wanted to 
get it fast done it very faster i would recommend you to go with the keras or tensorflow 2.0 Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, sir. Thanks for the comprehensive overview on uh, uh, the, the current technologies, the future technologies, sir. Actually, I am from mechanical back background, and mm -hmm. in our, our college is one of the premier colleges, and we are setting up a good robotics lab. Okay. So, and also regarding, uh, I would like to work on some AI applications. So, I uh, I would like to connect to you later for any technical uh, help. Are possible collaborations? Sure, so, sir. Uh, I think so. You are able to see the screen, uh, my mail ID and phone yeah, number, right? Yeah, yeah. taken it. Yeah, sir. Please uh, contact me. Uh, uh, you can uh, write back to me in this mail ID, or even you can uh, send me a WhatsApp message in this phone number, so we can get connected. And uh, of course, uh, I can I can see what help I can do for you, sir. No problem. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. There's one more question, sir. <laughs> uh from kiran kambe how you compare nvidia sdks with google collab okay so first of all we need to understand what we mean by uh, google collab so google collab is just an infrastructure provider where it gives you a infrastructure to work with so uh, the most of the people will not have a gpus on their own they will be having only cpu kind of a thing that is why google came forward to create a infrastructure which is of free and inside the uh, google collab you have a two kinds of gpus you'll be getting one is t4 and one is k8 both are nvidia's uh, cards only and what is nvidia sdk is means is nvidia sdk is something a software development kits by which you can write your code in a very good manner google collab is just a platform just just like you are having one gpu in let's say you are getting a new laptop and which is going to have a nvidia gpu it is like just getting one laptop in the cloud architecture and which is going to have an nvidia gpus on top of that you can actually use the nvidia sdks and do it it is not either or question it is a joint question since you are already using a google collab maybe you can use a nvidia sdks and start working on the uh, google collab itself There's one more question in the chat. Uh, by yeah, sure. uh, mm -hmm. So he's asking that how to start learning different machine learning algorithms. So is there any specific source from a begin from for a beginner? Uh, so I would uh, suggest you to take uh, the courses. So if you're uh, if you're if you wanted to start it as a beginner, I would suggest you to go with the uh, Andrew M N G S course. That is machine learning course, which you can get from the Coursera itself. And it's I think so. Uh, it's a free of cost kind of a thing, or you uh, it has some. Uh, It's very limited. Uh, the price is not that much. It's a, uh, I think so. I'm not sure about it. But that is a way you can start your journey in this uh, machine learning. And also, there are a lot of blogs and uh, tutorials available in the internet because today the content which is available for learning the fundamentals of uh, machine learning or AI has become very accessible and simple. But if you wanted a structured thing, I would recommend you to go with the Andrew Ng's uh, course where you can start having a structured uh, knowing the basic of it but one suggestion i would give is uh, if you wanted to really start your journey in machine learning and want to become a machine learning engineer or a data scientist or that kind of projects if you wanted to handle i would suggest spend some time in understanding the mathematics behind every uh, uh, the, uh, algorithm rather than just putting the algorithm just coding it because when you're calling the machine learning algorithm or the deep learning algorithm code is, has become very simple it's just one line or two line is what your algorithms has been called but the amount of mathematics is involved in this is going to be very much uh, more so please take some time to understand the mathematics make your fundamentals strong so once your fundamental is strong that then you can go to any field and you can solve it that is as sir was telling one of the sir is doing in math um, mechanical field or that that kind of field also requires machine learning kind of a thing so i would suggest andrew ng and all the fundamentals and uh, uh, in that specifically go for mathematics problem statements and understand it from that manner participants any more questions
Okay. Uh, so one question from my side. Uh, mm-hmm. Now uh, the heating issues of GPU, uh, okay. not only GPU, but even the CPUs. So a mm-hmm. lot of research is going on. So mm-hmm. what uh, is there a part of uh, it in the software too? Uh, to be honest, in the software, no. Uh, we can't uh, reduce the heating issues. You can. So first of all, let's uh, we have to understand why this heating issue actually comes, right? So uh, this is what I was talking about when I was in my previous slide when I was telling when I was talking the differentiating between the Pentium three. I was saying we had ninety five lakhs uh, transistor that comes into picture. So I meant to say that we can't put more transistors into my uh, that is uh, into my GPUs because it gets heated up. So that is where. your computation happens so uh, it is not only about you stop putting the transistors and computations that is going to happen it is about how you communicate with your gpus also so software wise what you can do it is to reduce the uh, heating kind of a thing software wise you are doing what you are what you are actually trying to do is the thing says you can write a better uh softwares so that what can happen over here is it can give you some lesser number of that is more performance in a very less time so that your machine is not getting much heated up so that is what you can do in software wise but uh, this is what you can do it in the software wise but uh, heating issue is mostly related with uh, 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 mostly related with on the how hardware is being treated and how your uh, uh, the inside those things that is your um, communication between the transistors happening but now now nanotechnologies are in very good form and they are coming into it and the neuromorphic chips if you see that in the neuro side of it uh, those kind of a things those research is also happening uh, so very sooner we'll be having smaller chips which very less uh, heating issues can also be uh, possible but for your question yes you can write few algorithms in a certain way that will not get heated up fastly that is algorithm but that is not that not going to solve All hundred percent of problems. Okay, thank you. Yes, participants, any more questions? Yes, sir. I have one question. I said, uh, Professor Nitin Pisa. Uh, so yes, sir. So I am sir. working in MIT World Peace University. So, uh, can I know what are the approximate cost for uh, setting up uh, deep learning training institute uh, for, for a batch of twenty students? uh i would actually uh, uh commercial wise i would uh, like uh, th- that depends on how what is the uh, uh, this one you're going to uh, look into it right so i can answer this question very specifically if you can put me a mail or we can have a communication uh, in the uh, in the phone or something because uh, i need to understand much more requirement from your side and then i can give you some specific numbers it's not about numbers it's about what kind of uh, technologies you are looking for how much gpus you are looking for how the, how the communication should happen those things and all we can discuss so maybe if you can call me uh, to the number which i showed you uh, and if you or if you can drop a message of your mail id i can send you the cost approximation for uh, setting up a lab kind of a thing uh, okay uh, that's very good and regarding jetson so what type of applications we can run on jetson uh, board Okay, so Jetson, as I said, it's an uh, inferencing uh, board. So what I mean by inferencing is, after you trained your model, and if you wanted to inference, you wanted to test it or put it in the production, that is where your uh, Jetson comes into picture. So presently, what we do, uh, let's say a student is doing a project in artificial intelligence, what he does. this he does the training in his laptop and he shows the output also in his laptop but in a industry way that is not a way, that's not a method because i can't use my system to show me the show the output or put a inferencing in the same system so that's where i go for the smaller uh, gpu kind of a thing where a jetson and the your application side what we can do is whatever you can uh, you have trained it in a deep learning that is a uh, computer vision nlp or uh, reinforcement learning robotics everything can be or medical imaging everything that applications can be ported into the jetson so jetson is nothing but a compute facility but which is in the small form factor mainly used for your inferencing kind of a thing okay thank you sir okay sir thank you okay so is there any more questions 
Yeah. Yeah, go on. Uh, so yeah, nice, uh, nice in uh, session actually it was. Uh, so my question was, uh, so you told about that uh, industrial, I mean, industry academic uh, diaps. Uh, so you will provide a setup for lab and all. So so are you so will you provide the virtual kind of the cloud based the test beds kind of things? Uh, we don't provide cloud based systems. systems. Yeah, more uh-huh. effective also. That's what I'm asking. Okay, so actually we don't provide the uh, cloud based setup kind of a thing because uh, we don't have we don't have a private cloud for us. Uh, so NVIDIA GPU cloud, as I mentioned, it is not a cloud; it's a repository. So we don't provide a cloud based setup. But maybe uh, cost wise, we can see if your if your research is very good and those kind of a things, we can see if we can sponsor or we can co sponsor. That is, we can give you the. Co- funding for your uh, gpus also that can be possible but since we don't have a cloud access we don't have a cloud company uh, at our thing we we don't uh, actually give the cloud access to it so uh, maybe we can help you with the cards uh, uh, so that we can do it but uh, not a cloud kind of a thing okay so okay, thank you Any other questions? Okay. So I would like to summarize this session. So thank you for this informative session. Uh, So everyone, even you can see the chat box. Since half an hour, everyone is thanking you. That's a good session. Thank you, sir. So you talked about AI computing, types of AI, evolution of GPU and the need of GPU. How hardware and software are equally important in GPU performance. How GPU has significant impact on AI. How NGC containers are changing the performance parameters. It is also providing scalability and problem-specific setup. How end-to-end deep learning models are there and how they are evolving day by day. How different models are created for different set of work and how use cases, different use cases can be solved using different setup of GPUs. So once again, I would like to thank you, sir, for enlightening the crowd. I hope everyone enjoyed the session and found it innovative. And with this, I conclude this session, today's last session. Pavita, ma'am, over to you. Uh, yeah, Vinay, sir. I think Pavita, madam, yeah, she is okay. there. Uh, thank you, Hari Arun, sir. This uh, session was really very nice. And also, we are having the Tesla B100 in uh, our center of excellence is machine learning and deep learning. So Great. we need your help. Sure, sir. Sure. That. Yes, yes. So definitely we'll, uh, uh, we'll call you, we'll interact. Later on also we'll have one meeting and we'll discuss that one. Okay. Okay, sir. So, sure. I will, so, I'll do yes. that. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, crowd. Thank you so much, audience, for this. And thank you so much, uh, VIT and Professor Pavita for uh, having me. And it was a great session. Thank you so much. And any help required in the future, please let me know. I'm available. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Hare Aran, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Participants, oh. let us join tomorrow at 9.45 a.m. Yes. Yeah. Session. Okay. Uh, Madam, shall I uh, close the session? Yes, and uh, Okay. Yes.